Okay, hello everyone. I'm Linda Nickel and welcome to the Texas Women Photographers Circle. This is our monthly meetup. Here with me this evening are moderators Leslie Sessons, who's based in the Dallas Fort Worth area, Sue Pitts, she's in Georgetown, and Charlie Hickman is in San Antonio. Um, I'm Linda, I'm based in Austin. So every month we invite a guest speaker to share their photography their favorite tips, and a little inspiration to help fuel your creativity. The schedule for our upcoming presentations is on my website at lindanickel.com, as well as the links to previous sessions on YouTube. Tonight's guest is Valerie Hoffman. Valerie is a Pennsylvania-based photographer who is a full-time workshop and photography instructor. She hosts her own online meetup every, uh, every Tuesday evening. And so please check out her website, ValerieHoffmanPhotography.com, and you can sign up for her newsletter to learn more about her weekly classes. She's also a moderator for the Pennsylvania Women photographers circle. So, but, um, but in tonight's presentation, discover the softer side of photography. Valerie's going to talk about techniques that you can employ to create unique and compelling images by using soft focus lenses and accessories, as well as the role aperture and maybe lens choice, and maybe a little bit of distance um, to your subject. Um, can affect that image. If you're on Instagram, look for her at Valerie Hoffman Photography, and you can connect with her again through her website, ValerieHoffmanPhotography.com. Valerie, um, we're going to do some full disclosure, but first of all, welcome to our circle, our little Texas circle. A little disclosure, Valerie Hoffman is somebody that I met, oh gosh, what, 2018? Something like that? Wow. You've lasted that long. Um, <laughs> so I had, I had gone to a, a conference in Chicago. It was called Out of Chicago. In fact, um, Kathleen Kent, who's in this room, is somebody that I met from that conference as well. And uh, Valerie sent out a message saying, hey, I'm Valerie. I'm from Pennsylvania. I got here early. Does anybody want to hang out? And I didn't realize, but she got crickets. But I'm like, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to her. So I ended up spending an entire day with Valerie before the conference started. And guys, ladies, it, she is so talented. And I had a lot of fun with her. And she does t tell some corny jokes, but her photography is beautiful. And she's a very, very good um, instructor. So when I started my own Zoom programs called the Happiness Hour, I, of course, it was like, Valerie, come talk to my group. And this is not her first presentation for me. I don't know. I think you might, I think you might have the, the lead in the number of presentations you've done for me. But um, when we started the circle, she was on my list and I don't even give her an option. Like, you're just going to come talk. Let's just figure out a date. So thank you for coming and sharing what you know. And with that, I'm going to shut my mouth and let you do your thing. Well, thank you, Linda. And this is truly a, an honor. Um, I love Texas the whole two times that I've been there. I love the people. And so I can't wait to get back. Although I'm glad that a lot of you are from other places as well. And I'll just give you a real quick background. Like I've been taking pictures since probably I was about five. So I, I really can't remember ever a time that I wasn't really into photography. And um, I was in the photographic retail industry for 20 three, 25 years um, for Ritz cameras. And when they filed for bankruptcy, that was kind of um, the end of my job. And so I started my own business from then. So I've been teaching um, since then, leading workshops. <clears throat> and this topic is something that I absolutely love. I love um, soft focus. And so I'm pretty excited to be able to, to share this with you tonight. So we ready? Should I get? Yeah, we're ready. Let's do it. Let's do All it. Right. Let's blow them away. Um, 
soft focus photography that's what we're talking about tonight and i've put this kind of together like in a little bit of a presentation but we'll talk about what it is and what it's not so what it's not is those images that you thought were sharp and then when you got home and you looked at them real big on your computer monitor and saw that there is crap nothing in focus so that's not exactly what we're talking about tonight um, but when I just decided to Google the definition of soft focus, um, I found it really interesting what I came up with. And the main definition was the term saying that there's nothing sharp in the image. Okay. And that seems to mainly apply to cinematography um, more than still photography. But it's been, some of you could probably think of that, you know, right away, maybe an old movie and it's dated back to 1915. And this soft focus look added like a dreamy glow, mostly to actresses. Um, but it's currently still used a lot in portrait and wedding photography and absolutely um, highly used by floral photographers. So, um, and since I'm not a portrait or a wedding photographer, you will see... Hang, um, hang on one second, Valerie. There's somebody that came in and I've got to turn her off. Okay, sorry about that. It's okay. So since, yeah, I really don't photograph people on purpose, so you will not see portraits and wedding images here. But there was a quote that I thought was kind of neat, and it said, the end effect of soft focus is to give shots a dreamy or slightly unreal quality. And so that's what we're going to go with. And... I think that the term soft focus in photography um, can mean different things to different people. And so I'm just kind of going from the way I think of it. But, you know, if you want some examples of something where almost nothing is in focus, um, you know, here might be one. And this is, um, what do you call those with the, I think a dandelion after it uh, goes to see just really close in on the little white. Um, really close laying in blades of grass and tell me if I'm going too fast or slow Linda no you're um, good and this is a bunch of orchids I'm going to talk about a bunch of different techniques but the whole yellow dreamy look here is um, I did what was called a shoot through where I have flowers more yellow orchids right up against the lens and I'm shooting through and focusing on something beyond and that gives this kind of ethereal look so we'll go through that and then lens baby, I know we have a lens baby uh, pro on here, but yeah, so lens babies are super dreamy and I love um, some of the effects there. So just to go through a couple here and then I'll hit some topics for you and how we get there because you're really gonna be super close. All right, so what are the benefits of it? Like why try? So for one, it creates mood in your images, which they just have that really kind of neat dreamy look. And any kind of soft focus or shallow depth of field will really simplify your scene. Um, when you have too much in focus, that can be really distracting to the viewer. So this can help to, you know, centralize where they look. Um, and it invites you as the photographer to maybe explore more creative compositions. And um, one of the neat things, I think a big benefit is that it can render a common scene or subject in a very uncommon way. And it can be created in a variety of different ways with different lenses, filters, techniques, et cetera. So I'm gonna start with this one because this is one of those things where it's a very common thing that um, shows very uncommon. Can anyone that doesn't know what this is, can anyone guess what it is? Put it in the chat maybe. I don't know if anybody's popping anything in, but I was um, a lot of times after I've shot for a few hours, I start asking what if, because I might get bored and want to try something new. And I was photographing at Longwood Gardens, just these ornamental grasses. So the, the grass stems, petal, whatever, were much bigger than regular grass and kind of had some patterns. And I had on 180 millimeter macro and three extension tubes. And so that was all stacked together. And then I was in as close as I could get to. And this is really just a blade of this grass. And I liked it for the wave look, you know, the kind of curve. And so I shot the lens at wide open and I'm super like, I might only be an inch away from this thing. And this was the result I got. This is a blurry focused image of what it really looks like. So it's just kind of this 
neat, colorful, larger piece of um, ornamental grass is what I'm going with. So, but some ladies walked by me because I was kind of blocking the path and they're like, what are you shooting? Because there was no flower there or anything. And I showed them the back of the camera and they looked and then they looked into the patch and they looked again. And that's what's neat because they could not see this at all because that was created in camera. Okay. So there are a bunch of different ways you can do it. You can use soft focus lenses, such as lens baby lenses. Um, at one point, I owned a Canon soft focus, a 135 millimeter lens, which I don't even know if anybody makes anything like that or Nikon. Um, a variety of macro lenses I have used, and there are soft focus filters, you know, even like the diffusion filters that we used to use way back in film days and other accessories. And then I'm gonna go through some different techniques too, just such as shoot throughs like we just saw and even some um, in-camera multiple exposures. But the key with all of it is using a very shallow depth of field. So let's just talk about that for a minute. You know, what impacts it? And now we're looking to be super wide. So if you use your widest aperture and the wider, the better, so meaning, um, if you can get down to 2.8 instead of 3.5 or 1.8, that's going to be much better. And then the focal length that you use will also impact it. So the greater the magnification or more telephoto, the softer um, the effect will be. How close you are to your subject, that's another thing that affects it. So the closer you are, the softer it's going to be. And then also, if you are going to have any background in there, then the further your subject is from the background, the further, the better. And then one of the last things, and people tend to really struggle with this until you really start practicing, but how parallel you are to your subject, that makes a big difference. So if your flower maybe is like this and you come at it, I don't even know if you can kind of see, if you come at it at a real hard angle, um, instead of being completely parallel to the subject, that will give you super shallow depth of field. And then the size of your camera sensor makes a difference too. So full frame people will get less depth of field by the nature of the camera versus like your cell phone where everything seems to be in focus. So that's kind of the long boring stuff. So first tip, move in close, like as physically close as you can focus your lens. And this is the image that I use kind of to try and advertise today. This is the edge of an orchid. And I was drawn to this flower just because of the soft petal. And so by using um, like a 180 macro lens and just focusing on this part here, make sure there it is, just right there, wide open aperture. I'm almost right on top of this thing and everything else goes soft. The same with this orchid. I was drawn to like the wavy edge of the petal and it had just these little, I'm going to call them hairy. So I absolutely don't know the names of most of my flowers or anything or parts, but that's what drew my eye. And so I wanted your eye to stay on that. If everything was sharp, your eye would wander around. So I just sharp, um, focused right there and um, shot that. So super soft, um, the edge of another orchid. So they there's a lot of opportunities with them, but this almost looked like a, I don't know, a thousand legger or a caterpillar or something. And I just wanted, what drew my eye was all these little hairy edges. And so that's what I wanted to focus in on. And that part is only maybe about as big as my finger. So I am really close to it. And then just a couple more where I'm not quite as close, but uh, two different tulips. And like the one on the left, I was obviously drawn to the red edges and how pretty that was. So instead of taking a picture of the whole flower, I got in really, really close. And even though this petal is laying on top of this, um, by using a you know super wide aperture and being right close, that just goes like a soft yellow background. You and the same with this. Mm -hmm. um, can I scoot in a, um, a squeeze in a question real quick? Mm -hmm. Um, Debbie was curious, and it's a very good question. Um, for these kinds of shots, are you on a tripod or are you doing handheld? And then, um, you know, which which do you think is better for this technique? Um, I think being on a tripod is always better because when you're really close, it is very hard 
to get focus and keep it because all you have to do is move the slightest bit and you're out of focus. So something like that, you know, that ornamental grass that I showed you right in the beginning, I absolutely was on a tripod. Like there'd be no way to hold a 180 macro and all that magnification and get anything sharp. So um, both of these, I was on a tripod and I'm just sitting on the ground in a tulip garden. So I do a little of both. When I get to the lens baby, more often than not, I'm not necessarily on a tripod with that. And it, it's easier. You can have a wider aperture, you can get a faster shutter speed and it's kind of easier. And because a lot goes soft, it's not as noticeable, you know, your focus point, but that's a good question. Sorry. Okay, let me just add one more on top of that. Um, sure, sure. Would, would a remote shutter work? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you could use, so when I lead workshops, people will either have, you know, I, I encourage people to have either a remote, and it could be a wireless one as well, because hopefully nothing's moving, or you could even use a two-second self-timer. But yeah, if you're tripping the sugar, the sugar, the trigger yourself or the shutter yourself, um, there's a good chance you will move the camera a little as you go. So right. I'm going to squeeze in, more, squeeze in one more. Go um, right ahead. That gives me a chance to drink. Yeah. So. I know. Thanks. Um, so Karina, she, her question is, for instance, she has a 7200, 70 mm -hmm. to a 200 millimeter lens. She's wanting to know, are you saying that would be better than a macro lens? Um, yes and no. So you're, I'm just going to use from my experience with the Canon 70 to 200, you have to be four feet away from your subject. So four feet away, you could not get this it would not be in focus because you'd have to be you know really close but you could get like a canon 500d diopter lens which is just looks like a filter or the nisi and screw that on the front and then you could use that and yes it would be amazing it would be amazing and that goes for 100 to 400 i had some people on my last workshop a couple of weeks ago using 100 to 400 lens with a close-up adapter on it and I'll show you why and the difference in the backgrounds and things. So good question. And or then extension you, tubes you could use also with that big telephoto lens. Are you, do, are you using manual focus or are you auto-focusing? Manual focus. Okay. Oh, almost <laughs> always manual focus. When you're this close, your camera's just going to search. And I don't know if you've ever tried to shoot water drops like this, but the camera is going to search and search all day long and probably pick one way back here. So you really, and that's where a tripod helps where you're just still and you can do that. Okay. You know, get it really meticulous. I'm going to sneak in but, one more question. And oh, then I'm going to pick up because I don't, ahead. I don't, I don't want to run out of time. Um, someone's got a 50 millimeter 1.2. Would that work? Yes. And we're going to talk about that. So hang tight and I'll give you some examples. All right. All right. You're good. Thank right. you. So really close again, an orchid. And, you know, this is a tiny, tiny portion of it. So when you can get really close, it gives that soft um, out of focus feel. So let's talk about the lenses that you could have as an option. And I'm going to start with macro lenses and just in ascending order with focal length. So I currently use Olympus cameras. I currently have the 60 millimeter macro, which would be equivalent to a 120 macro on a full frame. And macro lenses, you know, this is a macro class, but you kind of know they can focus really close um, and are very sharp and good in low light. But the closer you get, they will give you the super soft um, look to your subject when you're getting in nice and tight. So here's a freesia flower, if I said it right. And I was intrigued by the little part in the center right here. And so I took the shot and I thought, well, that's real pretty, um, but can I do better? And so my next shot, was leaning into the bed and just, so you see as you get closer, how soft everything gets. And I'm just focused on these little hairy edges there um, and made what I think is a much more um, kind of compelling image. Same with this, just really, really close to the point where you might not even know, you know, what the flower is. The very tiny inside of the daffodil unless this was one of those really tiny ones. So focus there. And this, obviously what drew my eye to this flower was this red 
um, ruffled edge. And so I just focused right there and let everything else go soft. And so think about it. Where does your eye go? It goes immediately to whatever is the sharpest part of the image. And that's where I wanted it to go. So you really do have to focus very carefully so that what you want is sharp. So for me, I liked kind of looking straight down on whatever this flower is. And I just focused on um, these little tips at the edge and let everything else go soft. And then here's something different if you got tired of flowers already. So this was whatever that the cicadas were that came out a year or two ago, came out of the ground. Um, they had the creepiest eyes. And so just I got in as close as I could, you know, stomach it, you know, to try and get just close up of the eyes or nose. And then a hundred millimeter macro. So I used a hundred macro forever. That's one that I recommend just for price and ease of use. You can do some great macro images and then get even super soft. Um, again, this is an orchid and only just this portion of the petal is sharp. I'm not sure what this flower is, but it had just some really neat edges and they are sharp. It doesn't really look it, you know, through this presentation, but it's just where you have just small sections um, the backside of a Gerbera daisy. And you see the little bit of glow too, as you get that close. Backlit flowers too are especially great um, for the close up. I don't know why that's up. Um, focus just on the edges here, super soft. And one of these big ornamental leaves. Um, this might even be part of the same plan. I'm not sure, but I just love the red and green, the complementary colors. And I was at a very hard angle to this. And so the only place that's really sharp is right here um, on this kind of center part of the leaf and everything else just goes soft as if you vignetted it. And you could even do it with, you know, like this is a box of crayons laid out and just close here. And in this shot, I was in a, a zoo. I was at a reptile house. I was sitting down to look at who texted me, just kind of resting. And I had my head against the glass and I started feeling like I was being watched. And I turned around and looked and that was right against the glass. And, you know, at first it kind of terrified me. And, you know, what is it? It's all about the teeth here, right? So with that 100 millimeter lens, I shot it wide open right against the glass and just had everything else go out super soft. If I could shoot just one lens, it would be the 180 macro, um, at least as far as a macro lens. I have loved that lens. I've loved the images that I've gotten from it. Um, Tamron made the one that I was using with the Canon and just you get these amazingly beautiful, soft um, backgrounds there where your images can look like paintings. And it's pretty easy to eliminate distractions in the scene. And I'm sorry, I don't remember who asked about the 7200, but you could get a very similar look by being at 200 millimeters or more um, if you're focused in close. So just look at the soft, dreamy background. You pick your place to focus, let everything else go. Um, little tiny orchid. Now, some of you, if you're following me on Instagram, I was talking about the Martians that are inside the orchids. So here's kind of the little guy and just focused on that and everything else just went to a soft glow. Um, I always forget the name of these flowers, but just focused right here. And it's just a far different picture than if you shot the whole flower. Again, the edge of another um, orchid. And again, I just love the waves and I love the purple color. So chose to render it out of focus, a little water drop. And I don't even know what this is, but it looked pretty neat when I got in close on it. And then you can add close up um, adapters, filters, whatever, to a macro lens. So you can use close-up adapters on any lens, but you can also add them to the macro and get even closer. So I was with uh, my friend Deb, who I think is on here, and I was shooting these little buds, I think it was last spring, on the tree. And I looked over at her, and she's laying in the grass, 
nose up to this dandelion. I'm like, a dandelion. My picture is so much cooler. I'm like, what are you doing? And she shows me something that looked like this. And I'm like, what? I didn't know dandelion said little curlies inside. I never lay. I can't even focus that close. I need to walk around with reading glasses. And so next thing you know, I'm elbow to elbow with her in the grass. The park ranger walks by and thinks we're dead. But, um, you know, so just playing like we were lost in these dandelions for 40 minutes to an hour. And it is very hard to find something in focus when you're that close. But this was um, with my 60 millimeter Olympus macro and uh, like a Nisi filter on top. All right. Just time out. You're not calling this a dandelion, are you? Yes. Aren't okay. I? I don't it think it's dandy. That's not a dandy. Oh, well, you know what? It's a dandelion as a flower. I'm sorry. I'm thinking as the little puff ball. No, right. the, yeah, no, the flower okay. before it goes puffy. Okay. That's my mistake. Cause I thought, well, one of us is really off. All right. Sorry. It's you. Okay. For the record. Today. So, and you could do it bugs too. So this is a little tiny, tiny, tiny weevil. And when I get in super close to get his eyeballs sharp, then everything else went soft. So. But now the lens baby velvet. So I don't know how long maybe Kathy could put in the chat, how long lens baby lenses have been out, but I avoided them like the plague. I've tried a couple and they have a high learning curve or at least most of them did. And I don't wanna have to think hard when I wanna take a pretty picture. But then I was looking at this, I wasn't out of Chicago, but when, um, I was at a presentation with Ann Belmont and I think the lens baby velvet was new then. And she was showing these amazing flowers where they're just glowing. And I thought, that's my thing that made my heart sing. And so I walked out the door and bought my own and have definitely been a lens baby uh, fangirl since just for the velvet mostly. But um, so I have some images with that, but they come in three, I think, focal lengths, and you kind of choose one based on the size of your sensor. So I had the 56 because I was using a Canon 7D Mark II at the time. Um, 85 would be full, for full frame and then 28 for micro four thirds. Um, I have since, I was, you know, lamenting that I can't use my lens baby, but I can. I got a... Um, adapter ring it's since it's an all manual lens anyway the adapter cost me 25 dollars or something and i can now use that on my olympus with no issues so what's neat about the the velvet is it has a variable aperture so it goes from 1.6 to 22 maybe deeper 32 um but super shallow depth of field um and super dreamy at the wider apertures and you can use it like a regular macro lens, meaning that I can focus really, really close. And so the wider the aperture, the softer and the more glow you get. When you stop down to 5.6 or f8, you almost see no glow. So this is the kind of thing where, um, like John Barclay says, that makes my heart sing. And this is with the lens wide open the uh, Himalayan blue poppies at Longwood, wide open. And this one, this flower was back a little further, so the background isn't as soft. It was further from me, but wide open. And now here's some examples. So with the lens stopped down at F4, and I'm focused right here. So this part of the flower is pretty sharp, and then this is soft. But when I open wide, then that's the look. So same flower on the tripod and the difference. And now here's a little series. So this was, I believe at four, at four, and then 2.8 and then wide open. And I probably mostly shoot at the two 2.8 aperture so that it doesn't go totally crazy soft. I just let the subject kind of dictate that to me. So two point, or this was four, I believe, and then wide open. And when you have backlit flowers, it's just really pretty. Same thing here. Wide open. And this would be more stop down, like at 2.8 or three, three, five, maybe. So there's a, just by turning the aperture, there's a wide variety of um, different looks that you can get. Here was one at 
and this is an azalea bloom. So, you know, they're not a very big flower. I'm zoomed in or moved in really close and then wide open. And it's just kind of ethereal. It's so different from what anybody else, you know, what you're seeing with your eye. So I, you know, if you don't want a learning curve and want something, you know, to do some really beautiful work, I think a lens baby um, would definitely be something you love. And it's as easy to use as any other lens and you can focus to infinity. So, yeah, just glowing. A couple more examples wide open. And then you don't have to always do flowers. So this was at a Christmas display and I used the lens baby to just give it that nice softness. Now, the one, the second lens that I do have is I have a Sol 22 and that's made um, for the micro four thirds. And I'm still out a little bit, the jury's still out on it. I don't use it a ton, but what it does is it just has a fixed aperture. You can't change it. Um, and it's sharp basically in the center and then does this super softness to the sides or the edges. But it's, I don't know if you can, I hang on, I got rid of my picture. Um, you can tilt it to change where it focuses. So it's kind of like a, a tilt shift lens. And it does have a little bit of a learning curve, but here's an image just that I shot and it kind of looks like there's motion, just kind of a neat rendition. Um, no idea why that doesn't work. Um, real nice. And, you know, like if you shot film back in the day, you would use a spot filter and then you'd have everything soft or some people even smeared Vaseline on like a filter on a lens. And so you have it sharp in the middle and soft. Um, otherwise, I do like this one a lot. But it just needs the right subject for it to work. Um, one day we stopped to photograph a rusty old truck and it was under a billboard and it's on the road and there were all these distracting elements. And so I popped out the, the soul just to play around um, and really liked kind of that different look. And then nifty 50 for somebody who asked. So you can get really close with those. Um, I've used a 1.8 and a 1.4 lens. And uh, so you'd want to shoot with the aperture wide open. And if you want to do some really neat effects, you want your camera at a really hard angle to your subject. And then again, be as physically close as you can be, which I think is maybe a little more than a foot. And you can start getting some neat images like this. So I'm focused right here. Instead of being flush, I'm coming at an angle. And you said that little bit of sharpness. The same here. And so again, with doing something like this, you want to make sure you're careful where you're focused. Excuse me. Our pollen went up crazy now with all the trees and everything. So we're over at 10. So I'm just got the, the nasally thing going. The little honey sticks, I thought it'd be kind of neat. Get rid of the distractions in the display. So you can create some pretty neat images with the 50. I like to play with, um, you know, like writing on tombstones, some bottles. So those were some quick examples. Um, and then something like the Tamron 18 to 400, that is a great all around lens. Um, you know, I'm bummed now that I'm with Olympus, like that they don't make anything like that yet. But um, you can you can focus far away, but you can focus just inches away. And so you could almost use this as a macro lens, but you can, again, with that longer focal length, get the super soft backgrounds. And at three or 400 millimeter, you're still at 6.3. So that's not a wide aperture. But with that longer focal length, it gives you that softness. This was, I was photographing a magnolia flower. And I'm always looking for something unique. And there was just this little curl in a petal. And I had the 18 to 400 on and just zoomed in really tight. And then I was, this is probably a 50% crop because I couldn't physically get any closer with that, which is beautiful. So it doesn't always have to be a more expensive macro lens. And here's a couple with that 
canon lens. So this image on the left is with no soft focus. And then when you turn the dial to have it at its full soft focus, um, you have the softness on the right. And this I probably had like back in 2005 or six. So it was a long time ago. But it did create some, some neat things. And it was neat because you could use that lens as a regular 135 and then just flip it into soft focus mode. Did you have a question, Linda? I did. Somebody wanted, Karina was curious about um, a 150 to 600. Are you going to touch on that? I'm not. I did have, well, I had a 50 to 600 at one point, and I used that a lot to get the soft backgrounds. So you absolutely can. So you want to figure out how close you can physically be with the lens at 150 and at 600 and just start trying to shoot plants and things with that. You would get a super creamy soft background. It'd be awesome. So you might have to get an extension tube. You know, I don't know how far away that that focuses. You might have to get something to let you physically, you know, get in closer. But I think it would be great. And anything else? Yeah, uh, a different question. Okay. Um, Bridget wants you to clarify what you said about being at a hard angle when using a 50 millimeter. Do you, do you mean, um, do you mean about a 45 degree angle or less to the subject? I don't know that I could tell you the exact degree, but we could use this, this image as an example. So if I was going to be parallel to that flower, which I think is a daisy, then I would be directly over top of it shooting down. And then that whole face of the flower would be sharp. But coming in at a hard angle is like where the camera position is now, where you're just kind of maybe sweeping across it. You know, so I guess that would be 90. Um, and then just focus maybe on the edge of something. Since this was the soft focus lens, everything's, you know, soft. Does, does that make sense? Yes, thank or like, you. So if this is my flower top and this is my actual lens, so coming in like that, like really hard angle instead of being directly over it. And just play with it, like shoot a, a thing across, you know, when you're parallel and then start coming at an angle. You could be at F22 and still get, um, you know, almost no depth of field if you're at a hard angle like was with those 50 millimeter pictures. And, you know, some backlit leaves, they kind of had this glowy look. I think it's too kind of fake looking, but, but here is something that you want to learn how to do. I absolutely love shoot throughs. So I learned this technique maybe from Charles Needle, I think. Uh, that guy's super creative. Um, so you want to set your lens at the widest aperture. And then you put your lens right up against, so say this is grass, I know it's terrible. And you want your lens like right against your grass or other flowers, but you wanna be able to see through to focus to something um, in the background. And so in this case, I was on a workshop in Santa Barbara and we were shooting these poppy fields and Mark Munch was the instructor and he was showing us, put your camera down into the poppies and get them right up against. and. And it took me a while to figure out what he was talking about, but you put them against and then you find a way that you can focus on something behind and you get this super dreamy look. So all that orange glow is just other flowers that are out of focus. And then once I started getting the grasp and the vision, then I created this image and just thought it was so pretty and just focusing on that lupine and all the poppies just creating this soft vignette. And, you know, some of you might be able to do something like that in Photoshop. I have zero Photoshop skills. People here can attest to that. So I want to get it in the camera if I can. When I first shot this image, and this was long ago, like 2006, and I showed it to people, they're like, oh, it's fake in Photoshop or whatever. And, you know, thanks for the compliment that I might know how to do it. But this is just pink tulips all around here causing that soft vignette. And the same with here. Wide open aperture. These are both with the 180 macro lens, you know, in super tight, and that gives you that extra softness. And the same with here, and even closer. Same here. All of that, you know, soft yellow around it is just by shooting through other flowers. Same here. 
And then here, so this was with the 18 to 400. So you could do something like this with a telephoto and there were just these tall grasses and then these flowers behind that I was chasing butterflies on. And I just, you know, kind of popped the lens right up against these grasses and it just did that really beautiful kind of dreamy look. And again, it takes just wiggling around back and forth till you get something that looks right and doesn't look dumb. I was chasing this bug and ended up shooting, like move just a little bit so that um, grass must have come right in front of the lens and it just had that softness on him. And then I think this is one of my last um, topics here is in-camera multiple exposures, which can be pretty neat. And I definitely learned this from Charles Needle. Um, but what it is is, and you wanna check if your camera you know, offers this feature. Um, a lot of the newer ones do. Um, but it's a combining of images in the camera, like overlaying them together to create a neat effect. And um, the technique that I mainly use is to take one image at F16 and have the subject razor sharp. And then I take the second image totally out of focus at a wide aperture and get this glow. And there's just so many possibilities with multiple exposures in general. But so for this, this shot here, what I did was I focused on this um, statue, sharp focus, and then I just pointed at the ground and turned it totally out. And then the camera just overlaid the two of them, whoops, and came up with this. So two images here, um, step down at F16. Again, I'm super close to an orchid and sharp razor sharp and then the second one again i'm on a tripod because you you really need them to pretty much line up depending on what you're trying to do totally out of focus totally wide aperture and you get this so it's kind of like a shoot through effect but maybe even dreamier same thing here now nothing was in focus in these two images but just f16 on the one on the right and wide open on the one on the left this is with an 18 to 400 millimeter lens at 400 and we were photographing holiday lights and this was the image now i had no idea i never know what it's going to look like at the end i just try it and see and i thought this was pretty neat and then just a couple more that are you know same flower playing around with it, getting the glow. These are all in camera. And then this last one is um, in camera multiple exposures. When I had the Canon, I could do seven or nine different images. And regretfully on the Olympus, you can only do two. But I was using the 180 uh, macro lens, which has a tripod collar. And I did seven or nine, however many images it is. And each time I turned the camera just a little bit more and got that effect. So that's kind of neat. I mean, it's really ICM, but it is soft focus in there as well. And then one of the last things that's kind of totally different, but talk about soft focus. Um, I love fireworks. So if you follow me at all, anytime there's fireworks, I'm trying to be out shooting it and trying to eventually get bored and want to do something different. So focus pull is when you're just focusing, you're looking for just one image. And you start with the lens completely out of focus and at the widest aperture you can use. So maybe 1.8 or 2.8. And when the burst goes up, when you see it about to open, you quick ratchet the focus in. So you're out of focus, you hear it go poof. And when you see it about to open, you quick yank it in. And it is one of the hardest things to master. But when you start getting it, you can do some seriously fun stuff. Kind of looks like candles. I love this one. I just love the colors. And I guess it depends on, you know, where you are in the focus when it actually completely opens, whether you get a wide, you know, look to those little beams or smaller. But I just think it's really fun. So we're a couple of weeks away from fireworks real close to me that I get to go play. But the last thing is post-processing. Sure, you can do a ton of stuff um, in post-processing. Um, the majority of what you see in all my images is done in camera and then with some minor editing in Lightroom. Um, 
but I do like to play at times with the texture and clarity sliders using Lightroom's masking feature. So if I go back to this poppy, because I wasn't able to get the super soft background that I really wanted, I like this, but um, I wanted it a little more. And so I went and I did a, a mask, you know, the select subject just on the poppy, and then I inverted it. And so I was just messing with the background. And then I just took the clarity and texture down till it was softer, but didn't look fake. So sometimes I do do that with my backgrounds. And then this was years ago, people were into twirls and I got a free ebook that said how to do this step-by-step -step in Photoshop. And I took my image in and did that. And it was pretty cool. So, I mean, you could play with different things. So here's my info. I did type it in there. And again, just know that right now the website is down, but it's going to get back up and I'd love to have you. I do send out a newsletter at least once a month, but right now it's been every week with new classes and things. So I'd love to have you join me there. there I'm so Rick, and properly thank you for being such a doll and coming and um, doing a presentation for this group. So, um, so what are you doing next weekend, Valerie? Next weekend, I am leading a workshop, hopefully, um, in New Jersey for night skies. We're going to be out not all night, but we're going to shoot stars, star trails. We're going to be over the lighthouses. We might have some light painting going on. Christy might do some you know, fire spinning. We don't know yet. All right. So, so um, okay. If you so and want to join us, you still can. The class is Monday night. Okay, so let's talk about a couple of other things, because this is one of the things that you're terrible at and I'm really good at. Um, so you have a couple of workshops coming up. One is at Longwood Gardens. What is that? Okay, so I'm working with uh, Washington Photo Safaris, and that's April 20th. Okay. Well, that's and a Thursday. That Thursday. Okay. And then you've got one coming up with... Uh, Charles Needle. So what's that? Is I, I know two of them sold out, right? Or is that yeah, completely so it's two two week-long um, workshops that he's doing at Longwood and Chanticleer Gardens, which is in the area. And they are both sold out, but you can put your name on a wait list because people get sick or something. And you know, COVID, you get to switch without fee. So so yeah, I am, you know, highly honored to do to work with him because he's been a huge inspiration. Okay. So. Well, and there'll be a waterfall trek going online, hopefully this weekend. Okay. So that's something about Valerie. If you're a, what I learned is on the East coast of, of the country, you can get to two or three States within a couple of hours. You can't do that in Texas. So that's always kind of mind blowing. So you could do um, Longwood very easily and then turn around and get to New Jersey. <laughs> so, all right, Valerie, thank you so much for um, joining us tonight on the texas My pleasure. My women's pleasure. photography pho women photographers circle i don't know it's all so i get a free trip right to texas for doing this right sure said, right? i can i can offer you i don't know a bed and breakfast but i don't know you might have to that's a long way it's a long drive for you all right you guys can connect with her through her website valerie hoffman photography.com on instagram um she she posts, I think, almost daily there, too. So Valerie Hoffman Photography. Our next meeting is on Thursday, May 4th. And macro photographer Mika Geiger is going to be here to talk about photographing the tiny world of insects in her presentation, Backyard Beauties, Beautiful Bugs. Until next time, I hope that you have a chance to get out and explore and play with your camera and enjoy some of this um, spring weather. Uh, maybe not this week, but next week. Um, we'd love for you to join us next, next month. So until then, uh, have a good one.